Creating a life that is authentic, bold, and purposeful takes audacity. It takes disruption. That is what it means to be a professional troublemaker. Professional Troublemaker is a book, a podcast, and a life habit. I'm your host, Lovey Jai Jones, bestseller of books, aficionado of authenticity, and sorceress of side eyes, here to bring you conversations with world movers and change agents who have gotten where they are through their tenacity, their truth-telling, and commitment to making good trouble. From time to time, I'll even do deep dives on topics that are on my spirit. My hope is that this show compels you to do big things in a world where we have so much to fear. Let us loan you courage. Listen in. Before we jump into today's episode, know that this podcast is named after my second book and second New York Times bestseller, Professional Troublemaker, The Fear Fighter Manual, which, by the way, is now out in paperback. Not only does this paperback version have a sleek new cover and travels well, it has an exclusive bonus chapter called The Guide to Truth Telling. This chapter takes you step by step through the most common fears of speaking your truth and how to overcome it with boldness. How do you speak up in a meeting when the tough idea comes up? How do you confront a loved one who hurt you? What are the things to consider when silence is the easiest but not the best answer? I talk about all of that in the Truth Telling Guide. How would our lives be different if we were given permission to be disruptors for the greater good? How high can we soar if we knew fear is natural and we're actually supposed to do the things that scare us? How audacious would we be if imposter syndrome wasn't holding onto our ankles? I wrote this book, Professional Troublemaker, to loan people courage. In it, I talk about how my life has transformed because I run towards what felt bigger than me, doing the things that feel scary as shit. Professional Troublemaker, the Fear Fighter Manual, is game-changing, and my life is a testimony of it. Fighting fear yields authenticity and abundance. So if you value this show, the guests, their stories, the lessons and the wisdom, if you've ever said yes out loud to something that was said here, you will love Professional Troublemaker. This book is a verbal hype team to let you know you got this. So get a copy of Professional Troublemaker wherever books are sold or go to professionaltroublemakerbook.com. You can get the hardcover, paperback with the new exclusive chapter, or the audiobook, which I narrated and has a new chapter included. So that's professionaltroublemakerbook.com. Get your hands on it. Today's episode is a conversation with my friend and it girl of financial education, Tiffany Aliche. You may have seen her on the internet as the budgetista, creator of the Live Richer Academy, which is on a mission to provide women with the tools and access they need to create a better life for themselves and their families. It's a whole movement, y'all. The women that Tiffany empowers have collectively saved more than $100 million, paid off over $75 million in debt, purchased homes, started businesses, and completely transformed the way they think about their finances. Y'all know we're always trying to get our coin, and Tiffany and the Live Richer Academy shows us how to keep it and grow it. And y'all, this woman is just phenomenal. She's one of the most brilliant people I know. And she also happens to be one of my sister friends. She's just all around an incredible human being. And I'm so excited to bring this conversation back to y'all to listen to and get some gems from. Let's get into it. Rance fam, join me in welcoming my girl, Tiffany Aliche, to the show. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Tiffany, what's up? What's going on? Hey, my bad. How are you? Yo, I am excited to have you on this show. Let me tell these people how epic you are, okay? <laughs> Tiffany Aliche Smith is an award-winning teacher of financial education. She has made it her mission to empower women and provide them with access to the tools and resources needed to create a better life for themselves and their families. Through her company, The Budgetista, Tiffany has created a financial movement that has helped over 800,000 women worldwide collectively save more than $100 million and pay off over $75 million in debt, purchase homes, transform the way they think about their finances. She co-hosts an award-winning podcast called Brown Ambition, and she has an online school called The Live Richer Academy that teaches women how to create, implement, and automate their own personalized financial freedom plan. And Tiffany also happens to be my West African Voltron sister. Hey. And one of my favorite people, <laughs> Tiffany, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Oh, my gosh. Much overdue to have this conversation with you. You are one of my faves. And I always call Tiffany with questions and, and life situations. So 
she has all the gems to drop. So I always, I always start uh, this podcast by asking my guests, like, what did you want to be when you were growing up? You know what? It's so crazy because I became it. I wanted to be a teacher when I was growing up. And in my early 20s um, and also throughout my 20s, I was a preschool teacher for 10 years. Wow. So you were five, five years old and knew you were going to be a teacher. Yeah, I wanted to be a teacher because I was I'm one of uh, I'm one of five girls. I have four sisters and I was always super bossy. So I love telling them <laughs> what to do. <laughs> and I was like, oh, teachers get to do all of that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. But I can remember in college when I had to choose my major, I, I, I majored in business. I didn't choose teaching because I was like, I don't want to be broke. That's what I thought, you know, mm. teaching men. And so um, I thought, I'll you know, I'll go into business and until my internships showed me that I was not built for corporate America. Um, I was like, you're not going to steal my soul and my joy. So um, I, I returned to my dream of teaching and I did that and I loved it. So when you graduated from college, you came out the gate as a teacher. What grade were you teaching? Um, preschool. So right out the gate, my last year in college, I had a transformative trip to Nigeria, my first um, trip to Nigeria with my family. And I remember thinking you're about to graduate and you hate all of these corporate internships you have. What are you going to do, Tiffany? Do you take the money? Cause I, I, I've been made an offer. I think mm. it was like a $50,000 offer, um, from like, I don't know, some corporate agency. And at the time that was like big money. Well, at least to me. And yeah. I remember thinking like, Oh God, but I, I, I hate it there as an intern. How am I going to live there as like a a full grown working person. And my friend who was a teacher during the summer, um, she was like a teacher's assistant. I used to help her out. And I thought, I think I want to do that. But I was scared. I was, I, you know what? Because you know, Nigerians, right? These are your options. Doctor, lawyer, mm-hmm. engineer, mm-hmm. pharmacist. Mm-hmm. Everything else is a drug. Right. Like that's the equivalent. So I was actually scared to tell, especially my father, I wanted to be a teacher because it was like saying I want to be a drug dealer. Mm. And um, yeah. So, but I, I chose instead um, to take this teaching position. And I remember they paid me, um, I think it was $39,000 a year. And, but I loved it. When I tell you I loved it, I love the kids. I love the challenge of it all. I love transforming lives and inspiring people. And I worked like in the middle of the hood hood in Newark. And I, I even love that because I got to really see like what struggles people were going through. And yeah. I had grown up learning about managing my money. So I was actually helping parents and students at the same time. So tell me about that. How did you, yeah, how did you learn about money management and finances? Because you said your dad was a big part of that. What was it like growing up and how did you get that education of about money so early? So I was lucky. So my dad was a, a CFO of a small nonprofit, but he also was an accountant and he had his bachelor's, I think, in economics and his master's in finance. So money was a constant conversation in our house. So he was like the academic teacher of money. This is how you budget. This is how you save. And my mom was the the practical teacher of money because with five girls, you know, it was like, and plus, you know, Nigerian, so you're always haggling. I'm like, I didn't know you could haggle at Macy's. She said, you can't haggle anywhere. <laughs> Yo, not haggling at Macy's. <laughs> so I learned from her how to navigate in the real world when it came to money. And so we, we would we would have weekly family meetings and our financial state was something that was always brought up. And I didn't know that that was different or strange until college. And I found that none of my friends ever talked to their parents about money. And in fact, my college roommate... Shout out to, let's call her Benthia. <laughs> <laughs> so she had debt collectors calling the dorm room, which at the time we thought it was hilarious to like, you know, play play pranks on them. But I thought, you know, like, wow, how are debt collectors calling the dorm room? And it's because her parents had opened up credit cards in her name mm. when she was a kid. So I went home to my dad and was like, daddy, debt collectors are calling the dorm room for Benthia. And he was like, well, tell her to say this, 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 and this. And that was kind of like my first foray into, wait, knowledge can actually, financial knowledge can actually help someone. And so I started to become the go-to girl for, in college about like, well, how do I save my stipend? And how much should I put toward this debt? And should I get this credit card? And so it started there and it didn't stop when I taught preschool because I I was always really good at um, budgeting and saving. Because at the age of 25, I bought my, my first house, a condo. I was making $39,000 a year, but in two years, I'd save 40000 So I was living off half my income. Okay. I had bought my little putt-putt car right out of college. It was like maybe three or four years old. It was $5,000. I paid for that cash. And um, 
even when I moved out, I moved out with my sister. We, we got an apartment. It was 1100 bucks a month. It was all inclusive. And so that was 550 each. So I kept my expenses really low. I bought all of my furniture for the apartment bit by bit in cash. Hmm. And so I was like the living, breathing example of financial responsibility, especially in my 20s. As a matter of fact, I had a meeting with my um, uh, Superman, my husband, and I had a meeting with our CFP um, two days ago, and she was like looking through some of our policies. She's like, How? you have a $300,000 life insurance policy already. I said, yeah. She was like, but girl, it says you got this when you were 25. Exactly. I was yeah. at 25 myself, like, life insurance. Girl, you, know, I was, I was, <laughs> you were <laughs> deep. You, are, you were more responsible at 25 than most adults are today. Yes. Honestly, it, I was obsessed with personal finance, honestly, just just from a young age, because I, I realized that knowledge of money really could equate to security and freedom. And I wanted to crack the code. And once I cracked the code for myself, I, like even if I didn't teach preschool or teach financial education, I recognized in myself that I am created and made to teach like mm. that is like. I could have been a, a hair care guru that I'd be teaching something. Yeah. And so once I learn something, I can't keep it to myself. I have to share with others. Yeah. So let's go back to when you guys used to have the family meetings. Mm-hmm. Were your parents super transparent with how much money y'all had or if you were struggling or if you had a surplus? To, what were the family meetings like? Yeah, it was a mix. So my dad was actually really good. And he worked in his, in, as a youth, he was a teacher um, too, like in his 20s. And so he was really good at making financial education age appropriate when he, when he taught us. So I can remember like at age five, me, like uh, I used to turn on all the water in the, um, in the house. I, I, I love the sound of running water and he was trying <laughs> to figure out, I was feng shui before it's cool, you know, <laughs> he was like, should I beat this one? But she's so small. <laughs> I remember, cause we didn't have much money. I remember that we used to have something called ice cream day, which meant that one day a week, we would rotate days. One day a week, um, when the ice cream man came around, you could go inside if it was your day, if it was your, if it was your week, and go in and get a dollar for ice cream. Mm-hmm. And so the rest of the sisters would have to just go into the freezer and get like you know our like store bought ice cream. And so I can remember running in um, during the summer saying, "Daddy, the ice cream man's outside. It's my week. May I please have my dollar?" And he said, "Ah, so my Nigerian name is Adochi. Ah, Adochi, you're too late. The ice, the water man just came. I'm like the the water man came." He said, yeah, the water man came and I had to give him your dollar because every time you run the water, it cost a dollar. When I tell you I had a heart attack and woke back up and had another (laughs) heart attack, guess you never ran that water again. And so those were the lessons that he taught. So see, there wasn't he that was so age appropriate because I didn't care about the water, but I did care about ice cream. Mm. So by nature of caring about ice cream, I cared about the water bill. And he would also during family meetings, like they would show my dad would show like here are the bill. So here are here's the electric bill from the month before. Here is the electric bill currently. And he would always leave it on the dining room table for us to always walk by and see because wow. it was centrally located. And he would say if the bill went down, he would put money in our vacation jar. So wow. that you know, has to be like, EJ, turn up the dad on lights. <laughs> And so that's what it looked like. You know, we talked about like, you know, grades and chores and things like that. But we also talked about serious things. I can remember in high school, my mom lost her job as a nurse because her 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 um, hospital closed its doors. Mm. And so my dad said Christmas will come a little later because she did find a new job, but it doesn't start until January. So we're going to have Christmas, I think, like early February. So we didn't put up the tree until the end of January. And that's when we had our presents and everything else. But he was always really transparent about, but not in a scary way. That's critical. Right. right. You know? So it was always very matter of fact. And here's a solution. My dad is very much solution oriented once he finishes yelling at you. Correct. Um, so, <laughs> and so, um, yeah. So, yeah, it was th- those meetings were every I, I used to roll my eyes and be like, here we go. But I'm so grateful for those meetings. I think that is phenomenal because I don't remember ever having money conversations in that way. And the way your dad did it to make it be like, okay, you might not care about the abstract idea of wealth or money right now, but let me tell you how it affects your ice cream. Yes. That's genius. That is genius. So that is how you basically became this financial guru. So let's go back to you at 25. You got your condo. You got all this money saved. You had it all together. Did and then, like every good story, it all fell apart. Things fell apart. Mm-hmm. The center cannot hold, right? Chin Chin Chebe. Yes. And um, so so the recession happened. So well, right before the recession, I was feeling myself. I was like, basically, I was financially perfect. Eight hundred two credit score, condo, 
money in the bank. I had, I was dating a guy from um, college that we were together for six years. And so that relationship fell apart. Then I said, I wanted to learn to invest. So I reached out to a friend of mine who I thought was independently wealthy. He wasn't, he was a thief. Mm. And so I invested, oh, when did I invest with him? I think like fifteen or twenty thousand dollars with him, and and promptly lost all of that money. But because I thought that I was going to be making so much money from that investment, yeah, I started using my credit cards for the first time. I mm-hmm, oh. racked up another like ten, fifteen thousand dollars. So I ended up with like thirty five thousand dollars worth of debt Whoa. because I was like, woo, woo, I'm about to be paid. He was gone within like a few weeks, and all of that happened. And I thought that was bad enough. But here's the thing: had I taken responsibility, I was still making. I think by then as a teacher, maybe I was making 50 or maybe $55,000 a year. And and I was still living off darn near half my income. I could have paid off that debt and gone about my business, but I refused to take responsibility. Mm. I told myself it wasn't my fault. It was his fault. And so I didn't do anything except for pay the minimum because I was hunting him down like a like a hunter to try to find him. Yeah. And um, then the recession happened and our school closed within three days of us finding out. Are like, you serious? Tell you the way my heart dropped because it was summer and during the summer many teachers don't work and many teachers that don't work don't get paid. So I'd already lived off my summer savings and I was like, woohoo, school's about to start. And it was like, oh yeah, so school is not going to start. We lost our funding. And I was like, well, first of all, it was like, so now I've got this $35,000 in in credit card debt. I also have $50,000 and I just got my, um, at 26, I got my master's. I've got my, my, my home, my condo, $200,000. And now there's no income. You know, when I tell you the level of freak out, I was like, okay, so I went from financially perfect to literally everything being wrong. Wow. Um, I, I ended up moving. It was like I was 29. And I remember being afraid to tell my dad all the mistakes that I'd made. But I slowly, because my parents have a decent sized house and it's the house we grew up in. So I remember just bringing like a vase home, then like a blanket. Then my mattress, then my whole life. He was like, do you live here now? I was like, yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> and he was like, but he knew because he knew uh, that my school lost its um, funding. So I think he didn't realize everything else. So he was like, oh, okay, she's getting on her feet. I'm like, oh, I'm just renting out the condo. So that way, you know, I can get on my feet until I find another job. He was like, okay, don't stay long. I was like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> and um, But it was the roughest from 29, I want to say, until 32 32, 33 was the roughest time ever because 30 is when you feel fully grown. Right. And I was living like a teenager. I stayed with my parents for a year. I stayed on my sister's couch for a year. I rented a room, a room like I just came home from jail. Mm. I rented a room for five because that's all I could afford, 500 bucks a month. I was driving by then. My car was like so old. It was breaking down every other day. And I just remember feeling so disheartened. Like, how could I fall so far from financial grace. My yeah. credit score fell to a 547. Wow. I, I took up all the money from my retirement account to try to save my house only to lose it to foreclosure. Oh, I mean, everything. Oh, and I, that guy, we broke up. Like, I, well, I, it just didn't work out. It was just too much stress. And so I lost everything, everything. Wow. And I mean, now I look back on it. I mean, I didn't recognize it as such, but I definitely was in a state of depression. Mm. And I just remember thinking, but so here's, this is my, still my cure all for not clinical depression, you know? So there's a difference. If you have clinical depression, no matter how many happy movies you see, that doesn't affect that. It's hormonal. But my depression really was situational because Mm. I was literally sad, but for a long time. And I remember um, thinking, how do I break free from this? And it's still like a tip I share with people today that when I give myself of service to others, it it helps me to feel better. Hmm. And so I started doing all this volunteer work and I did any kind of volunteer work, whether it was kids, um, old people home, whatever, feeding the homeless. And every time I came back, I felt better because I was taking like the, the, the spotlight off the Tiffany show, which was a very dark and dangerous show. <laughs> right. And so I started volunteering. What I noticed is whenever I volunteered, I somehow would be teaching a financial lesson to whomever was there, you know, because I realized like, even though it was a recession and everyone was struggling, I was struggling, but a little less because I was managing my, my um, unemployment better than most people. And, um, so I found myself like casually, like, you know, teaching a lesson to the janitor, speaking to the, to the secretary and showing her this is, and this is how you save. And, and so I was doing that more and more. And then organizations started to hear about me in Newark, the city where I live. I started asking if I can come and volunteer to teach. And then one day someone asked me how much did I cost? And I was like, well, I don't cost anything. And I'm like, wait, I should cost 
something. <laughs> I should call something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember um, my my by my little sister Lisa, who's the youngest. She like back when I was teaching uh, preschool, I remember saying like, because I was so good at budgeting, I said I should have a nickname like the budget diva, the budget queen. And she was like, oh, you know the fashionista. I was like, oh yeah. She was like, that's not you. <laughs> oh damn! Not the- yeah, she was like, yeah. <laughs> she was like but you the budget nista, and literally that's how that name came about. Her shadiness. Her shadiness. Um, <laughs> And so I remember then I was like, you know, if I'm going to volunteer, I should resurrect that nickname and call myself the Budget Nista. And and I did. And it went from volunteering to getting my very first contract with the United Way where I used to volunteer. They were like, can you teach a series of of lessons to the community, which was really my favorite because I used to do one on ones with folks Mm -hmm. and they didn't have money to pay when I started to transition into a paid business and it made me feel bad to take money from someone who didn't have money to pay. So I didn't take any money. So we're both broke now. Mm. And so I looked at my business model and I realized that I wanted my business model not to be a nonprofit, but to, but to maneuver almost like a nonprofit where I made money, but it wasn't a burden to the people I was serving. And so the United way was the first um, organization to give me a contract and I wrote a series of classes and they paid me and then I was able to offer it to the community for free. And that's how my online journey kind of started. It was that my job was to fill the class. So I started sharing on social, hey, teaching a budgeting class tonight. It's free. Just come by Tuesday at 7 p.m. And I started getting known on social media because I was always posting about the class and what they learned and, and sharing that. And um, I started getting messages from women in particular who lived in different states mm-hmm. saying, I, you know, I don't live in Jersey. How can I attend your class? And I thought, oh, I don't know how. And then I decided to take the series of courses and classes that I wrote for the United Way and, and put it online. And I called it the Live Richer Challenge. And my goal was, I remember the first year my goal was to get, it was 2014 or 15. I said, I want to get, I want to get 10,000 women signed up for this free online course, my challenge that I've written. And it took me a year because I didn't know anything about like ads or marketing or whatever. I just used to post every day saying, you know, January, 2015, the challenge is going to start. If you want to help with help with your finances, it's totally free. People didn't believe like, it can't be free. She must be selling something. I wasn't, you know, I don't even know where I got the money from. Cause what I added up at the end of the year, I spent $10,000 to put it all together of my own money, just because I wanted to be of service and 10,000 women signed up. By the time I hit January, I had 10,000 women signed up. By the time January was over, another 10,000 had signed up. Wow. And, and then I made it evergreen. Um, and we're up to 850,000, almost 900,000 women that have signed up for one or more of the um, literature challenges. I've since, since did one every year since then. So there's the fundamentals. That was the first one. Then there's a the savings edition, the credit edition, net worth, um, and home buying edition. And so I do one every year and they're, it's still free to this day and they're all evergreen. And so at any moment in time, anyone could go to livewithyourchallenge.com and choose one and get their life. It's my give back to my community because when I tell you the shift that's happened, especially with women of color, that's who I, I serve mostly um, in that community because of those challenges, people still can't believe like, so they're free? I'm like, girl, it's year five. Yes. Yes, it's that's <laughs> wild. Yeah. I, I don't even remember how you and I met, Tiffany. Do you remember? No, I, we met at Essence Fest, but I think we we met online somehow. But we right. definitely because you're Nigerian, so you know once you, you're like ah Nigerian, that's my sister, my cousin. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> facts. But, but facts. We met at Essence, like some some five years ago, I think we met in person five years ago. But I had been yeah. following you, and I can't remember how I stumbled upon your work. But I remember just being like, yo, this needs to exist because there were so few people, especially who like black women, who were talking about money in such a transparent way. And it you you basically like if your best friend happened to be like, yo, let me help you fix your life, your financial yep. life. I always say, I'm not your financial guru. I'm your financial girlfriend. Yes. You know, that's what I'm here to be, to be like, girl, now you know. Okay, let's do it. Like, I'm not here to judge. I'm here to nudge you. I'm here to offer support. I'm here to offer resources. Resources. That like, yeah, I just think that if, if more women knew how, they would do better. You know, because when you know better, you truly do do better. Come and on. um. Come yeah, on. you know to do better, man. You want to come on, up. no better, do better. You know what I mean? I'm, shoot, we we we've been doing the do better challenge also to get people to get their lives together on a, on a business and and just in general. And one of the resources that we use when we did the finance because we did like three prompts for them to use for finance, 
And one of the prompts was like, go join the Live Richer Academy. Like, we can't help you deep. This is just one prompt, but the rest of the work, go ahead and go to Tiffany, and they're going to get you together on the finance part. Anytime I take a shower, I use a body butter, and I always layer it with oil for extra moisture. Brown Girl Jane's aromatic body oil infused with CBD is my favorite. CBD is one of my go-tos for relaxation, and the thing people don't realize about CBD is how amazing it is topically. It's highly anti-inflammatory and relieves muscle aches and pains. So when used in an oil like Brown Girl Jane's, it's an amazing solve. Brown Girl Jane's body oil is packed with skin-loving and plant-based ingredients that are designed to calm and nourish your skin. Plus, the scent is very light and refreshing, and it calms the senses, and the packaging is beautiful. I love it, and so do my muscles. So this oil and all of Brown Girl Jane's products are non-intoxicating, cruelty-free, vegan, and 100% natural. I'm fully leaning into my quest to become a lady of leisure, and Brown Girl Jane has all of my favorite CBD products to keep me cool, calm, and collected, giving full auntie vibes in my robe on my couch. I included this oil in my love list mailing, and people have been messaging me and texting me like, girl, this body oil is insane. So if you're listening to this and you need some self-care in your life, go get this oil. Head over to browngirljane.com and use the code LUVV15. That's LUVV15 for 15% off all Brown Girl Jane products. So it's amazing. Get into it and let it bless your life. So ultimately, you wanted to serve and it allowed you to build wealth. Yeah, it's honestly, it's so crazy because I'm not going to lie. There's days when I'm like, how did this happen? Because in my mind, I knew that I didn't want to be broke. Yes. But I also have this other side of me that's like, I truly want to live a life of service. Like, like my, if I had to choose an idol, it would be um, Mr. Rogers. Mm. Like, I'm, like, he is everything to me. Like, just the kindness. Like, when you think of Mr. Rogers, you just think of like, yo, so kind and generous and good. I'm like, that's, that's who I want to be. It's like, well, how do you be wealthy in that? How? Because what they've told you is that kindness equals brokenness, you know? And I said, no, there has to be a way to help good people, make good money, and do good work, Mm. right? Help good people, make good money, do good work. There has to be a way to do all three. And we figured it out over here at the Budget Nista that we give most of what we do away for free. The challenges are free. I send out weekly emails with all these dope resources. Most of those are free. I've got a Facebook group. It's 400,000 women deep. All the information in there is free. Right. And so like in the beginning, I knew how to do the help good people and do good work, but I didn't know how to make good money. And then I monetized my influence by in the challenges. I realized I remember the very first challenge I did. I rec- I um, suggested this bank. I really like Ally Bank. I suggested that bank. I, I did not them. know. Yay. Yeah. Right. So I did not know that Ally was offering you twenty five dollars per person that you signed up. Who knew? At least 3,000 people signed up for Ally Bank because of the challenge. Imagine, do that math. Wow. And that's when I was like, oh, okay. So then I started to realize, so I met my business partner, Jabril. Who was on, he was a guest on this episode. People love Jabril's episode, by the way. He's the dopest, honestly. He transformed my life because he's the one who was really like, he helped me with the make good money part because he was like, Tiffany, you're already sharing these things. Make a list of things that you share resources, books or whatever that you share that you believe in. And let's see if they offer something called an affiliate program, which is when someone pays you per person that signs up. So I made a list of things I was sharing anyway. And like of the 10 or 15 things, three of them had affiliate programs. And so I started to say, so I went into my blog or any post and I switched out the regular link like ally.com with my affiliate link. And so that's how money started to be generated. And I said, okay, that's one way. Then I started to write books. Every challenge has a corresponding book. So the book you don't have to get in order to do the challenge. But there are some people who literally were like, I don't necessarily want to do my learning online. I want to hold something physically. So I'm like, okay, that was another money making venture. And then we started the Literature Academy, which I'm so proud of. It's an online school where it really helps you to level up to the next level. So all the basic financial education things are free. Mm -hmm. But if you want to learn how to buy real estate, you want to learn how to invest in stocks, you want to learn how to estate plan, you want to learn how to grow your your retirement, side hustle, all of these next level things Mm -hmm. um, are what's inside the Literature Academy. And 
that helped to take us to seven figures a year. And I think in January, we're right on the cusp. I think we're going to crack seven figures a month in January. Yeah, mo- come I'm on. Mm-hmm. I'm here for that. Yep. And so, but even now, so this is what happens when you do good work and you help good people. And this was unintentional that what happens is brands come to you and they're like, people believe and love you. You know, Mm. could you share, you know, our thing? And so I vet heavily. I have my Lisa rule. So I will try anything. But Lisa, who is my, my, my community, we're like the beehive, you know, Beyonce's beehive, but a personal finance. So they call themselves dream catchers. So the dream catchers, Lisa is a dream catcher. And I ask myself before I share anything, would I feel comfortable if Lisa signed up for this thing? Mm. If she came home and said, hey, you know, I, I downloaded that app or I joined that thing. And so I'm there are things that I would say yes for me, but I would say no for Lisa. Mm. So if it does not pass my Lisa rule, I do not share it. I would have way more money now if I didn't have a Lisa rule. But so in 10 years, there's never been a backlash of Tiffany, you lied, girl, you lied. Like none of that, because I adhere strictly to that Lisa rule. And so that there's nothing that I've shared that I cannot proudly st- stand behind. Like I don't do credit repair agencies. Nope. I don't do like someone just hit me up yesterday saying, we've got this luxury credit card. We'll pay you $200 per person that signs up. Do you know how much money that is? And I said, nope. They're like, are you sure? Nope. I don't push credit cards. Like secured cards, I believe in, but a credit card for credit card sake. Why would I put you in that in position like that? Nope. Right. So I get I get solicitations all the time and I, I say yes to very, very few. Um, I mean, even big banks. I mean, what? They get so mad at me. A big bank in particular, they wanted to work with me so bad. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I was like, I read the headlines. Y'all are literally the worst. Y'all they are the worst. Sis- what? They put a sister on the phone. Mm. Hey, girl. I was like, oh. Let's call her name Crystal. Hey. She was like, look, um, I know. I don't want to get in trouble. Could you at least come in for a meeting? I said, why they got to put your sister on the phone? Because you, know, right. you know, I don't want her to get in trouble. Right. So I said, all right, Crystal. I don't know you, but I'm going to come in for you, and I'm coming in my chucks. Okay? Yes. So I were, yeah. Look. I came in my chucks, and I jeans. So they were all like, it, the conversation started as if, like, I should be lucky to work with them. I said, can I stop right there? Because before I got on the train to get here, I actually put up a post in my Dreamcatcher group 400,000 women. And I asked them, how do you feel about this bank? Good, better, and different. What are your experiences with this bank? Would you like for me to read their responses? They said, no. I said, that's the problem that right Correct. there. Correct. And I said, I'm not interested in working with an uh, uh, organization that is predatory to my people. That's what you're asking mm. of me. I was like, the truth of the matter is I would share you for free if you did the right thing. Wow. I just came to tell you that to your face. Like if that's what you're wanting, if that you're looking for, I have money. You know, and even then back then, I didn't really have money like that. But what I still, you like, walk in there like you got money. OK, yes, we're gonna, that's what we're going like, to do. It. Yeah. I was like, if you want me to work with you, then do right by the people that you're supposed to be serving. Don't Come worry on. so much about me. Come on. And so they were like, when I left, because, you know, when you reject somebody, they want you even more. Crystal called me was like, girl, you read them like a novel. She's like, they want you so bad, girl. I said, well, I'm not interested. She was like, no, they want you to do what you just did in front of all the executives. Come on. We're going to. We're going to pay you $25,000 to do so. I said, okay, yes. I could be there tomorrow. I could be there tomorrow. <laughs> what time y'all need me? <laughs> no, no, that's really important because I also think part of the the confusion people have about people like us with platforms is they they throw us into the whole influencer category. And with that, they just think indiscriminately, like that we just think, okay, it's all about the cash. We'll just endorse whoever. So the Lisa rule that you employ and the integrity that you've shown is something that is, it's the reason why you have 850,000 members of the Dreamcatchers group is because people trust your integrity, which means you can always monetize your work. Always. And if you do right by people, they will do right by you. I don't think people get that, that like you don't have to. I want, I mean, honestly, I can't wait until we're an eight figure year company than a nine figure year company because then I'm going to, I can't wait to talk my ish. I can't wait to be like, they, they lie to you. You don't have to take from people in order to receive. You don't have to, I mean, even my team. So I've got a team and I call them the unicorn squad because I say they make magic happen every day. Right. And so like, even them, I believe everyone should win in all that I do. So I want to win, of course, but the people that I serve win, of course, the people who help me do the serving, they win. I just brought them back. Me and Jabril just took them on our, our second annual, um, uh, retreat, unicorn retreat, took them, they, we, they get to choose where they want to go. We give them budget. We set aside 2% of our income of our gross income in a savings account. And they get a budget. They're like, Hey, you could do whatever. No, no Alaska, no Hawaii. Cause we ain't got money like that yet. <laughs> <laughs> soon, but you, soon. 
And I said, but anything else, like, you know, so, I mean, it's amazing. We rented four, four Airbnbs. We, we had like two or I think like three cars to get us around. We had a private chef. We had a spa day. It was amazing. Our um, ATVing, it was, I mean, so amazing because we worked digitally all around the country. And some people actually flew in from different countries. Um, and so it was amazing because so many people were meeting each other for the first time. Like you see their little thumbnail or video chat. And so to get together, and when I tell you, it was like a family reunion. You know, you don't even know. Like, it's like, I don't see Tamara every day, you know, like I never see her because Tamara lives, I think in one of the Carolinas. I don't even know. But to see her in person, it's like, this is my sister right here. Mm. So I believe that everyone should win. And I want to change the change, really like the, the conversation around business that, that if you're in business, what you really are is in the service business. Mm. How are you of service to the people who work with you, who work for you and that you work for? How? And so, yeah, my Unicorn Squad members, like, like I've had people that started off when I was first starting at $8 an hour, and now they're at $80,000 a year. Come on. That's so, it. like, you know, because like, they know, like, we're really transparent in the company. Like, they get to see what we make. They know we've done the math at what percentage of our of our gross income, about no more than 25 to 30% of our gross income should safely go toward payroll. Because anything above that, you put the company in jeopardy. Yep. So they know that. They see that. And so they know that when the company does better, we all do better. I just gave raises the other day. They're like, well, we just got one. Mm -hmm, here's another because the company's doing what? Better. Yes. And so I treat my Unicorn Squad members as, as if the way I want to be treat, treated. Like we go above and beyond. They know that our rule is you, your family, your health, first, second, and third. That 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 what we do here, we save lives slowly. Don't ever put yourself in jeopardy um, to, to do so. That if you're not feeling well, don't come to the meeting. There's nothing that we're doing that's life or death. Like, I'm not one of those people that are like, oh, but I, I, you know, because first of all, everybody works hard. But if you're someone, if I see that you're overwhelmed, we will have secret meetings like, mm, Logan seems overwhelmed, but you know how Logan does. She's not going to ask for no help. So what we're going to do is mm. secretly take these things off her plate and then we're going to give it to someone else to help. Like, we do that all the time. They do that for me, too. So because we have this thing, and I think a lot of women do this, that you will drown silently. You will be in the water. You won't splash. You won't make a noise. You will literally allow yourself to drown silently. Right, right. Disturb people around you. You need lifeguards in your life. Who's going to be looking around for you to say, wait, is that lovey drowning? And jump in and come get you. Mm. And so I always encourage everyone on my team that you need to be secret lifeguards for the other people on the team. You don't have to tell her you're her lifeguard, but you're keeping an eye out for, for her because our team is uh, like 90% women. And um, but yeah, I just believe everyone can win and should win. That's incredible. And I think it also goes down to just you as at the core as a person. Like Tiffany is low-key my business coach. Um <laughs> literally. <laughs> Tiffany, I know we got we got something to talk about. After this. Literally, Tiffany will call me like Lovey. We have to talk because uh-uh. No. What are you doing? You're doing too much out here. You're doing too like you get on too many planes, and she'll be like, let's strategize. Yes. And in those moments, like we just had one of those calls last week, and I was like, okay, get me together, get me together, Tiffany. All right. And it's really I think your life is kind of like a testimony of what happens when you basically live in abundance and abundance always comes to you. Like you set out to be somebody who just serves people and all of a sudden all this money is coming to your life. You're making all these great relationships. You got married to your lo the love of your life. You, yeah, your, your whole life is abundance. And I think it's because you, you kind of own that. And when you start, like, I, I have the saying that giving activates abundance mm. because it truly does that when you grab, you can only hold what you are able to, to take. Right. But when you give, you allow yourself to be open to what anyone out there can can then give back to you. Mm. And so, like, you know, I you will if, as a giver. Now, you, now, here's the thing, because women sometimes forget like that you also have to have like so if you want to have a business of service or just a life of service you have to have a service plan which typically comes easily but you also have to have a payment plan like how am I going to make money so I think people forget that giving on its own or being service on its own is not necessarily enough if you're trying to run a business you also have to think to yourself how do I monetize the things that I'm doing mm -hmm. and so that's a critical component but I'm telling you when you sow these seeds if I tell you like 
so I'll give an example. I so I have my podcast, Brown Ambition, and um, I was, a young woman wrote in and was asking, like, you know, how do I get confidence in myself and you know, dream big? And I told her that I have this exercise that I do at the end of the year with myself and the team. We call it our our audacious goals that we get to pick. We get to say huge, major what seem like impossible goals, right? And then then once you say it out there, then you can start putting a plan toward it and you realize they're not as big as you think. So mm-hmm. I was like, I'll go first. My big audacious goal is I, I wrote a children's book and the character, is her name is Molly, M-A-L-I, so African cute. country. Because y'all gonna get that African work. Her name is Molly Moore. And um, as I said, my big audacious goal for her is to to be the next door, the explorer, because door, the, the door brand is worth about 7 billion with the B dollars. I want her to have merch. I want her to have a TV show. I want her to have a series of books. I have all these things that I said. So that seems like crazy to me to have some billion dollar brand, right? That's my audacious goal. I say it on the podcast, but look what happens when you plant those seeds. Why two days later, someone, I, I, I'm, I'm messaged me on IG Hey, I am um, an executive producer for new programming for can't even say. Yes. But it's three letters, and it's a huge network that we all know and love. And I was like, wait, what? And why she happened to be Nigerian Igbo? I said, oh, of course you are. Why would you not? <laughs> right? So she was like, um, heard you on a podcast, been following you, Seeds Planted, see? Her, uh, been following you for years, love it. Let's talk about making it into a show. She has already connected me with two production studios that are, I know if I said the names of the people who own these studios, you'd be like, oh, no, oh, no. I mean, I, I, and for what? Meanwhile, ask me if she's read the book or seen the book. She has not. She has not read or seen the book. But look what happens when you we sow the seeds of service yeah. that because she's been on the reciprocal end of that, she is now sowing back into me because she won. She's like, I think what you yourself, Tiffany, are a good person. But I I know that whatever it is that you've created, because I have not seen anything that has not been good. I know whatever it is is amazing. And I want to get in, get in on it early. So don't be so so quick to and so focus on getting yours, taking yours. Yes. You know, like giving and serving equals abundance. Leave yourself open to receive receive in a way that because you've you've planted those seeds of giving yeah and I also I always talk about the audacity to dream is half the battle like a lot mm-hmm. of times we hold our dream so close to our chest that we think it's because if we say it out loud we're jinx, jinxing it but a lot of times when we let go of our dreams and kind of give and show that I am being bold about this thing that I want yes your helper might f- hear you might see that post and say oh I know somebody who can help you with that piece so I always want to encourage people to not be afraid to dream out loud and dream boldly and be audacious. Mm-hmm. And show up with excellence. I mean, yes. I think one of the one of the traits of a Nigerian family is there's an expectation of excellence. Yeah. Right. Like your mama don't want to hear nothing about this B. What's it B? Well, B for what? <laughs> <laughs> a B is for bad. Right? <laughs> but that there's this expectation of excellence that like once you start to adopt that in your life, when you reach a level of excellence, people come get you. Mm-hmm. They will literally knock on your door and come and get you and say, been watching you for a while, basically waiting for you to get to this level. Now that you're here, I'm here to I'm here to escort you to the next level. Yes. You know, yes. like so, I mean, sometimes people are, they always ask, right? Like, how do I get in that door? How do I, I was just telling my mentee this. She's like, I want to connect with this person and that person. I said, girl, don't worry about them. Are you creating excellence where you are? They will come to you. They're watching. I promise. Yes. They will come to you. What? People knock on my door. I mean, this, I'm tell, I can't tell you how many times I, I just taped, I can't even say the show. I just taped some huge show like a, a couple months ago because the woman randomly was like on my IG was like, this looks dope. Came to the taping. She's like, well, can you come tomorrow? Yes. Can you come in? Yes. Came ready, face, hair done. Excellent. Killed it, killed it, killed it. Just hit me back. Was like, we want to do another segment with you. Can you come? Yes. Yes. You this, see, like. <laughs> this is definitely like, I, I also had a conversation with my mentee last week. She was like, oh, I want to make sure that my blog is popping. I said, worry less about whether your blog is popping. Are you writing and creating the work that is most excellent for you? Do you yes. think it is? Before you do that, don't worry about whether it's popping or not. Because if it is popping, if somebody lands on there, is there something for you to be proud of on that thing? So that's an absolute... F- you got to be ready for opportunities. Yes. Got to be ready by being excellent. Just do the work and then just see what comes. Because I think so many yeah. people are so concerned about the awards, the accolades. I literally had somebody message me and say, like, I want to win an award one day f- for writing a book. And I'm like, have you actually written the book? <laughs> Do you have a book idea? Have you been writing as a practice? 
Every yeah. time people are so worried about like, oh, I want to meet this person or how do I get a, you know, how do I level up in terms of a squad? And I'm like, are you showing up as the best version of yourself? If you're not, don't worry about who you want to meet. Exactly. Because you won't be ready for them anyway. There's actually nothing worse than getting getting to the place that you want and not being able to maximize it. Yeah. Don't even wish that on yourself. Yes. Right? People don't want. So here's the thing, right? You want, you're at door one and you want to go to door 10. You mm-hmm. want to skip through two, three, four, five. Not realizing that at door four is the key for door 10. Yep. So even if you get to door 10, you're going to stand there anyway because you can't, you don't have access. That access comes through experience. Yep. Access comes through relationships. Go through the steps like door one, then two, then three, because you're going to collect the things you need along the way to be ready for what's behind door 10. Correct. Because if you skipped door three to five, the mistakes you were supposed to make in door three to five... Mm-hmm. You, you can't afford to make those same mistakes at door 10. What? So you end up being like, ah, oh. the lessons are just as important as whatever Definition. blessings are too. Yep. Because again, those, which is also why whenever people go viral and go for the actual mm-hmm. people who are overnight successes in the real way where nobody knew them one day and then the next day everybody knows them, basically skips doors two through eight. Yes. What happens with those people is, yes, they have momentary infamy or fame. They can't sustain it because they didn't get the lessons they needed. Mm-hmm. You want to be a slow burn. Slow burn. Like, I call myself a 16-year overnight success. Mm-hmm. Slow and I don't want burn. No, hot, no hot flashes over here. I want to be a slow burn. I want 10, 15 years from now, y'all still talking about something I've created or Correct. made. or Yeah, like, it's it, because if you, and there's nothing wrong. I mean, some people are able to, to sustain some hot flashes, but I was listening to a, an interview by Jay-Z, and he said, that it got exhausting trying to be the hotness. Mm. Like year after year after year, he was like, when he finally let that go and he was able to then lean into business and an entrepreneur and, and like an enterprise. And he realized like, wow, there's actually more power here. And he was like, without the pressure of being the hot thing. And so, yep, slow burn. Very few people are able to do both, to be hot consistently for year after year. And that's exhausting. It's exhausting. But also, people need to understand that be gentle with yourself that you can take a year off. Beyonce be taking, we only hear from Beyonce for a year, mm-hmm. two years at a time, and all of a sudden she come back and be like, boom, this is what I've been working on. And I think in the social media space, people have kind of been taught, like, you can't leave. People will forget who you are. Nah, man. Sometimes you got to, like, go be quiet for a second. Mm-hmm. Brew your next thing so then you come back ready. But you want to be intentional. Like, one of the reasons why I started the... Because the budget needs is the business of Tiffany, right? Yeah. I am the budget needs. I teach the budget needs. I write. I speak. I, I, I. And so I remember saying, my next business, I'm not going to do all that because it was exhausting that if I didn't go out there, I didn't make any money. And I, that was, and it was okay for my first business because you don't know. Mm-hmm. And so for the academy, the Literature Academy on Purpose, I wanted to... Um, I really wanted to, like, just share some of that pressure and so that's why the Academy, the Literature Academy is taught by different experts inside the Academy, right? On purpose. So it's not just all on me and I could pull myself back some. There's no expectation of me showing up day in, day out. And um, it was the best thing because I had to be intentional because I remember saying, I want to have a family and there's no way that I'm going to be able to do that if I'm never home. So I had to be really intentional in how I built that part of the business to not have to include me in a way that was going to take me away from home. And even now with the budget Nista, now that the academy is kind of up and running and doing well, I'm I'm intentional about even reorganizing the way the budget Nista um, works. Of like where it's not like I have spoken very little this year. I think I maybe four or five times when before maybe it was like thirty or forty. Very little this year because I've worked out different ways for the budget needs to, to make income that doesn't require me to go somewhere. But you have to be intentional about that. That's why I said we still got our call. We still got to talk. Right, lovey? Yes. No, because, because like, I'm I'm basically where you were three years ago right now, mm-hmm. where I literally this year hit a wall where I'm like, my business is too dependent on my body. Right. Mm. And that means if I burn out. My business doesn't make money. It means I can't take months off. It means that, like, everything is based on me jumping on the plane, me being on the stage, me writing this piece. So Tiffany has been a part of my strategy session of, okay, how am I? Because I also want to serve. Like, I've been one of my core values is, like, I don't want an information hoard. Like, I, And I think information, um, lack of information and access is really a pro- problem. And I love teaching the things that I know. So Tiffany's been helping me strategize on, okay, what does that look like to teach the things that I'm passionate about, the things that I'm good at, the things that I think more people need access to without my body always being the one that is yeah. the one it's dependent on. So I'm going to be using the Budgetista blueprint 
honestly, because this year I also launched a, I launched a Do Better Academy with the public speaking masterclass first, and people loved it. Like, mm-hmm. my whole thing is that how do we build a world in where black women and women of color and women who are not typically the ones who have access to this type of information, especially on building bomb ass businesses, um, how do we how do we basically replicate the skills we have and give it to other people? Yes. And, and 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 honestly, I love that because the more people that you can help, the more people you could turn into people that can be self sufficient. Like I I used to uh, tell when I was a, a teacher and I would see other teachers that were a little bit lazy, I would tell them if we were just po- packing boxes, I wouldn't care. But these are people. Yeah. That little boy that you're ignoring could be your doctor one day, mm. or maybe or. He could be the boy on the street that steals your purse and pushes you down. Mm. Like that starts here in this classroom. We get to help to determine what that what you are going to experience out there in that world, you know, because you truly do reap what you sow. Right. And so the same like a woman that I've helped to, you know, now all of a sudden she could support her kids. Yes. Her kid might go on to, to, to cure cancer. Yes. And cancer might be something that someone who I love has. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. But me not realizing that, like, oh, I played a role in him being able to grow into the adult that he is now, you know, and That's that huge. like. We really just get to like you, 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 my mother would always say that you reap what you sow. You don't always reap where you sow. Mm. That is not your job to worry about like the end. It's your job to worry about what you're putting in. And so just putting that first. And I mean, that's why um, this year I'm like, honestly, probably my proudest, proudest moment is I work with a friend of mine who is an assembly woman and we got that budget needs the law passed. Yes. Mm-hmm, where it's mandatory for, for middle school students to get financial education integrated into their curriculum. And we already have a law in place for high school. And so she and I are now working on a law for um, elementary school. So we will have all school children will have gotten financial wow. education by the time they got to college. That is the aim. Because if we could normalize financial education the way it was normalized for me, imagine if you could have millions or hundreds of thousands of budget nistas running around who are financially responsible. And what that does is that that builds economic justice. That's that's yeah. economic justice right there. And I think that's huge. That is huge. I, yo, like, there's a couple of us in Voltron who I feel like <laughs> our work is very tied, even though we're in completely different industries, <laughs> in that we all kind of stumbled upon the things that we love to do, which is ultimately to serve people in some way, and then we're able to find money through it. What is your advice for people who are like, you know, I haven't figured out what my piece of service is. So I always tell people this, if you want to serve, serve, right? So one of the ways that I figured out where where I was supposed to serve and in what way was through volunteering. Mm. You know, like I did a lot of volunteer work, but not, not, not begrudgingly. God loves a cheerful giver now. So through volunteering, you will find that what is the thing that you're doing? Like I would be volunteering to feed the homeless, but meanwhile, I'm speaking to the chef talking about, and that's how you fix your credit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't recognize it in myself until someone's like, girl, you always give it out financial information. I'm like, wait, you know, you're right. So through, it was through volunteering that this thing inside me kept coming up. One, it was teaching and two it was financial education. So volunteering helps to unearth like the thing that you would do anyway. That's what you're really looking for, mm. right? If that's the kind of life you want to li- live. Yes. That's, what is the thing that you'll do anyway? So volunteering allows you to do that because if you didn't like feeding the homeless, you're not going to go. Correct. You know, second or third time. But if you find yourself always going down to the, to the um, I don't know, ho- um, like the homeless shelter, like a children's hospital, and you're there all the time, mm, there's something there. Yes. What, you know, so that's what I say. Start there through volunteering and being observant about yourself. I'm I'm I try my best to really be in tune with myself. I'm always asking myself, how am I feeling in that moment? Am I feeling joyful? Is, is this something that's exciting to me? Because it's my something on the inside is telling me like because here's the thing. That thing is there already. Like yep. the thing you're meant to do is there already. Yes. You're just here to unearth it in yourself. But you're not listening because it's so it's so loud out here. You know, and people and so, always they look past the thing that feels too easy because they're like, yes. that can't be it. No, that thing is probably it. That thing that <laughs> you do all the time that feels too easy that you sleep about and that you dream about that your friends always come to you for. That's the thing. Yeah. And so people don't or they don't want to do it because they think to themselves, I don't know how to monetize that or I don't know how to. And not everything is meant to be. Not everything you do is going to make money off of some people. Maybe it's, you're just meant to do that while you work whatever job that you work, you know, but listening to that thing. 
And in following that thing, that's where you're going to find your most joyful and fulfilled life. And honestly, too, that's where you're also going to make the most. Because when you do something joyfully, you know, and with intention, you are planting the seeds of of growth for yourself because you're going to put in more time, more effort. And that's what it takes to start to grow wealth and to make more that if you're begrudgingly going to work, it's going to be hard for you to elevate and get a raise on because you barely want to be there anyway. But if you are loving the thing that you're doing and you're putting that extra time, extra energy, extra effort, then that's where you're going to see where there's going to be a direct correlation to you making more in that in that in that thing. Yes. Look, look y'all better be picking up these gems that Tiffany's <laughs> dropping. Y'all better pick up these gems. Look, OK, she's like the, the perpetual gem drop. I be trying to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Like if I, if I, I feel like I truly am a tool, right? If God could take me from preschool teacher who was making, like I said, $40,000 a year. And at one point was like nearly $300,000 in debt, just not even 10 years ago, $300,000 wow. in debt, living in a room. It was a house and it, it was a post recession. So it was filled with, filled with um, all these other broke women like myself, but I knew them from around town. We found this house and we each rented a room. If he could take me from that at 31, 32 till 33, I was living in that room. I just turned 40 now. And my net worth is I think like 1.2 million or so or 1.28, something like that, right? I run a seven, almost eight figure a year company. Well, uh, three companies really, but one of them is that's the seven figure, almost eight figure a year company. Um, I, you know, I helped to manage over 30 people. I mean, I've helped millions and millions and millions of people like the, like from TV, like I'm the go-to financial expert for the real. How does all of that happen? How? It happens through intention. It happens through service. If you ask me, it happens through staying the course and being, and, and, maintaining your integrity to the reason and the purpose why you're here. I, I, I used to have shiny, shiny, um, object syndrome where I run off to this, run off to that. No, I stay focused. I know I am here to, to teach and whatever that looks like. I already know Molly Moore is going to be a billion dollar a year business. I know it's already done. It's done. I feel it. I know it. Now it might happen in, in 10 years. It might happen in 10 months. It might happen in when I'm no longer here, but it's already been told to me. I feel it. I know it. I'm moving forward with faith in it. Mm. And so, like just, I don't know. I just wish more people really realize that everything they have is already inside them and they don't have to look outside themselves. They just have to do the work. And you can build a life of good money, doing good work, serving yeah, good, and people. good people. Yeah, there you go. Listen, look, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I'm letting you know right now. I'm just going to write that down because that is, <laughs> that's the goal. That is the goal. So as you're doing all of this, service and giving back and being the boss and being dope and eating jollof. What are you doing to take care of yourself? What's your self-care routine? Honestly, my biggest self-care thing is I'm a napaholic. I take a nap a day. Seriously? Oh, I love mm-hmm. naps. I, love Yo, naps. I take a nap. I don't care what it is. I don't care. I'm like, oh, I'll tell somebody in a minute. Oh, I got a meeting. So I got to wrap this up. <laughs> and my meeting is my bed. <laughs> right. So <laughs> napping is one of my favorites. Walking. I don't, I, 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 I'm better at self-care now than I was, but not as good as I want to be. Mm. So I, I love a good walk, although I don't walk as much as I ought to. Um, and But I do hang out with my friends more, which is great. One of my really great friends lives around the corner. And so, like, we'll go to each other's houses and just hang out. So she's gotten me out of the house a lot more since she's moved around the corner. So I would say hanging out with friends, taking naps, um, and walking when I remember to get outside the house. Are you a massage girl? No, not really. And I'm not, I'm not a nail and, and, and feet girl. Like, I mean, I mean, it's okay. I mean, I, I'm not going to say I don't like a massage, but it's not something that motivates me to like, I really, honestly, I, I like spending time with people that I, that I like, like I'm, I'm big on laughter. I laugh a lot. So I love like my friend Rihanna, she and I together are like, yo, you ever met somebody you just like, yo, we are like 10 year olds. You can't take no <laughs> Facts. <more. laughs> yes. So so that is something I realized like, oh, Tiffany, you really enjoy maybe just growing up in a big family and always having like laughter and loudness. I, I enjoyed that with my friends. So I've made it um, my my mission to hang out with my friends more. And thankfully, my niece and my nephew actually live around the corner, too. And they're four and, and, and two, which is such a great age. And um, so that's like, like if I'm having the worst, 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 worst day, it is my guaranteed pick me up. I'll call my sister and say, oh, I need to see them. Aww. Because as soon as I open the door, they we have this like thing, which my sister hates. We I taught them like to scream as loud as they can when they see me so I can get all the joy. So when they see me, they literally scream. Ah! Like, <laughs> 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 like I'd 
Beyonce. Yes. And, like, and so, and then they jump into my arms and we play and I'm just like, you know what? I don't care what's going on out there that I know when I see Roman and Amelia, that all that for the hour or two that I hang out with them um, is melted away. So that is my guaranteed uh, pick me up. I love it. So you have to be around good people. Yeah, no, we have a good time. We have a good time whenever we, we're we together. We be cackling and being loud. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and oh, you know, gosh. Say, like, I was thinking today, I was, like, shopping, uh, like, food shopping, because they said a storm is coming. And I was thinking today randomly, because I was listening to something, and I was laughing. And because I have a loud, old, ignorant laugh. I don't care, same, right? so, same. <laughs> And someone looked at me and it hit and reminded me that the guy that had broke up with after six years and one left, right? Um, he used to tell me that I laughed too loud. And I thought to myself, and he was telling me, you show too much joy. Can you imagine? What? And so I thought to myself, wow, because my husband now, Jarrell, is the opposite. You know, and I just remember thinking like, wow, what a blessed life you live now that you're not with someone mm. who literally is telling you to show less joy. Wow. And if you are with somebody who you're with, I mean, Lovey's Wedding, I mean, I'm sure y'all heard the episode. When I tell you epic and amazing, <laughs> epic and amazing. I mean, like I, I'm Nigerian, so I've been to plenty of Nigerian weddings. And that that it wasn't even like a regular Nigerian wedding. It was like the standard center. Okay. <laughs> and so, uh, but you could tell, like you know, you know, me, 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 and Jarrell have been on vacation with you and Carnell. Yeah. And you could tell, like the love, the respect, the you are able to be yourself and and grow. There's nothing like picking the right partner. Yeah. It is better to be by yourself yes. than to be with the wrong. Because imagine if I was with the joy stealer now. Oh my god! Like you know, like like reducing my laugh so he could be more comfortable. Ooh. Now, mm, make we, sure you're. Not, go ahead. May we all be with people who laugh with their bodies, and that's part what? of the. Re- my husband is somebody who he laughs with his whole body. Like, <laughs> 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 like you laugh with your whole body. People who yes. do that are people who harbor joy. Yes. And I'm like, don't please, if someone tells you that you laugh too much, you this too much, you that, you really want to be with someone that you're able to be your full and complete self actually better mm. because I didn't realize how much of myself that I had yet to pull out. Jarrell pulls out more of me from me. Wow. Woo. There is a, um, Zora Neale Hurston has a, a, a saying or um, a quote in her book, um, Your Eyes Are Watching God, yeah. that like my soul crawls out of its hiding place. Ooh. And that's with him is that wow like I didn't even realize I was hiding my soul for so long that hiding my light that when you're with the right person your soul will crawl out of its hiding place and you will be able to fully be yourself like I'm still unraveling with him we've been married two years now dating for five before that I'm still unfolding because I'm like I feel allowed to be fully myself there is no greater gift than to be with someone you where you're not afraid to be yourself with so I don't care like because honestly my husband's not fancy. He's a little hood. Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> I love Jarrell. He's, <laughs> right? like, he's a regular, regular dude, nine to five. He's not, you know, I make way more than him. But, and, and, and I'm not going to lie. At first, I definitely was like, dang, I, want, I thought I was going to get a doctor, lawyer, you know, like pharmacist. No, he's none of that. He's a super for the city. But when I tell you the best man I know, besides my father, the mm. best man I know kind to a fault i mean where we used to live before kids would knock on the door is mr Jarrell home he said that i can use the bike punk for my bike <laughs> he said it's gonna be a haircut just even now i came home and my my best friend's car in our, is our in our driveway and i'm like what's what that doing here oh you know the other day when linda was here it sounded weird so i told her to leave it i'm gonna take it to the mechanic yep. and get it fixed. yeah yep. what that yep. is Jarrell. so That's, yeah so yeah. i don't yeah. Say what they want. I don't need a doctor, lawyer, whatever. I'm my own doctor, lawyer, engineer. Listen, like, and honestly, I, that kindness is huge. Like I have yeah. a, I have a niece who's autistic, and I think maybe the moment when I realized he was going to be the man I marry is she doesn't let anybody cut her hair ever. She don't let anybody mm-hmm. touch her hair, none of that. And one day he was like, "Let me try to cut her hair." We we was all like, mm, "It ain't gonna work because she gonna mm-hmm. start screaming." Yo, sure enough, she was quiet. He was like, "Watch your iPad." And spent 45 minutes cutting her hair. And everybody's jaw was on the ground. Oh, Like, it, what? <laughs> that's when you radiate kindness from the inside, which he does. Yes. Yes. You know? Which he does. And so, yeah, finding the right partner, choosing based upon the characteristics that you truly need, not what the world needs to see from you. Correct. Like, he ain't got to be, you know, the tallest, the richest, the yep. finest. If he is the person that makes your soul crawl out of its hiding place, bruh. If he right? or she, or yeah, they, exactly. it was 
that exactly it's true that 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 but that's for you to decide i'm telling because people will have a lot to say at the end of the day though when you go home how are you feeling look home should be your sanctuary and that's self-care in itself that's why you don't need necessarily to do too much because you can always retreat home mm-hmm. man that's real tiffany ah so how do people find you how do you want people to uh make sure they plug into the movement so this is just a business lesson for every y'all. I am the budget needs to everywhere. Don't be the budget mama here, the budget queen, the budget. <laughs> like, you know how to do it. You're like, oh, oh, be consistent. <laughs> but try to own all the properties. But yeah, I'm the budget needs to on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, the budget needs to.com. If you need that free help, like I said, um, live with your challenge.com. You could pick, don't pick all of them. Pick one at a time one of the courses. They're about three weeks long. Um, And so pick one of those. And if you're wanting to just go to the next level, because like I said, basic financial education should be free. But if you are good on the basics and you really want to elevate up, we've got the Live Richer Academy. And um, you can go to uh, join LRA for that. Um, But yeah, this has been awesome sauce. Tiffany, you just blessed all the people and me you know, with all these lessons because, man, people just need to understand that you can live the life that you want, even if you didn't necessarily design it in the way that mm-hmm. feels most right. Yeah. The life that you want that is out there. And, and today you can decide. That is your homework. Make the decision that I want something different for myself and I ought to have it and I can have it. And I'm going to put myself in position to have those things one foot in front of the other. Yes. Ah, you're the best. You're the best. We'll be talking very sh- uh, soon, I'm sure. And uh, y'all, follow Tiffany. Yo, shout out to Tiffany for joining me. She's amazing, y'all. Like, Tiffany is one of the best people I know. Do yourself a favor and go get yourself some financial wisdom. A good place to start, you follow Tiffany on social media. She's at The Budget Nista. That's T-H-E-B-U-D-G-E-T-N-I-S-T-A. On all platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, And, of course, check her out, um, the Live Richer Academy. It's really amazing work that they're doing over there. If you're somebody who's like, I got to get my financial life together, it's absolutely a must-do, right? I'm endorsing the Live Richer Academy because I've just seen how incredible the impact that they're making um, is. I've seen it. So, yeah, y'all follow Tiffany everywhere. And uh, much love to Chicago Recording Company, where I record this podcast. And as always... You can follow me on social media. I am at Lovey everywhere. 